I want to give a big thanks to our partner Distillery for hosting today's first session. Please give a big welcome to Melinda Han Williams, the Chief Data Scientist for Distillery, for a talk about the next innovation in identity, targeting without identity. Take it away. Thank you. So my name is Melinda Hahn Williams. Um, I'm the chief data scientist at Distillery. I think this is still on. Should I turn it off? It's good. Okay. I'm the chief data scientist at Distillery. Uh, for those of you who don't know Distillery, we are the customs audience solutions company. So we do um, our for years our flagship product has been custom AI audiences, which is a just for your brand targeting um, that uses identify identity uses identifiers to target your audience. Um, so at Distillery, we're very interested in what's next for identity. And today I'm gonna to talk about something that I think is a big piece in the future of identity, and that is targeting without identity. So the next innovation in identity is no identity. Really what I'm trying to do here, the point here is just to say it's a good time for us all to challenge our assumptions. So today, um, I mean, okay, let's, let's step back a bit. Right now we're clearly in a moment of change Targeting is changing. I don't need to go through the list of forces that are in motion right now, but I think we can all agree in this room that um, the, the availability of ind individual level data is, let's say, in transition right now. Um, and so this is really an opportunity. This, this moment is a, an opportunity to rethink some of the truths that maybe we've relied on for years about digital advertising and about targeting and about identity. So I am today gonna go through three assumptions Two assumptions that we at Distillery challenged, which led to the development of ID-free custom AI. This is our custom AI targeting solution to reach people without identifiers. So just what it says on the tin. And uh, the third assumption that we didn't even realize we were making, which is, I guess, how it goes with assumptions. And so this is one that, um, that caught us by surprise and ended up kind of changing our view of it. So let's jump into the first assumption which is that behavioral targeting requires identity. And to be fair, until recently, uh, most behavioral targeting solutions that were out there, all behavioral targeting solutions really did rely on identity. Um, and in particular, relied on this sort of ubiquitous, always on identifier, um, can only reach a person that has an identifier associated with them. But it doesn't have to be that way. So if you think about programmatic targeting, Programmatic targeting is all about making this decision. Should I show an ad here? And making that decision billions of times over. Behavioral targeting uses behavioral data to do this. Kind of a simple enough definition. So usually what that means is that um, there's an identifier. There's some kind of identity that links that behavioral data to the user. Um, that could be a deterministic ID, um, could be like third party cookies, or UID2, ramp ID, um, or it could be a probabilistic identifier, some other kind of link that, that connects that data to the user. Um, in any case, typically when we think about behavioral targeting, we're thinking about some behavioral data that's tied to the user that we use to make that decision about whether or not to show the ad to the user. So what about when there's no data available? So can I still reach this user with my messaging? Uh, can I still decide if, um, if I should reach this user? And and to be clear, no, I'm not talking about trying to figure out who this person is anyway, or trying to find out information about who this person is anyway, even though there's no identity or no data about this person. Because remember, um, and all of this know this, some people don't want to be tracked on the internet. And all of us should respect that. So more and more digital inventory doesn't have an ID associated with it. Um, after cookies go away, most digital inventory won't have an ID associated with it. So we're left with this question of, how do, I, um, how do I show my messaging efficiently and also respectfully to people who don't want to be tracked? So the key insight for us at Distillery was to stop trying to figure out who this person is. Let go of that assumption that we need to know who this person is in order to target them. Um, and that let us uh, shift our, our focus from trying to figure out this person to trying to understand this targeting moment. And once we framed the problem in this way, that let us take 
all of our AI and our machine learning and point all of that at understanding this moment, understanding its value to a specific brand. And when we, when we were able to do that, we found we could actually do a pretty good job. So at this point, you might be saying, wait a minute, you said we were gonna be talking about behavioral targeting without identity. This sounds like inventory targeting. And the thing is, if you're going to try and make this targeting decision based just on this inventory moment, literally it could even be just these three fields. The, the way to do that, it's all about bringing in as much signal as possible, as much information as possible to, to bear on that one decision that you're gonna make. And what we found is far and away, behavioral signals work best for making this decision. So we think of it as a behavioral inventory solution. It's using behavioral signals to understand that targeting moment to then choose the best impressions that drive the most value for the brand. So our goal is to understand that moment, understand that inventory moment, and understand um, what moment is most likely to drive the behavior that the brand is looking to see, right? Um, and so in particular, what I mean by behavioral signals, I mean, how does this moment fit into somebody's digital journey? So you might say, uh, how are you gonna understand how it fits into somebody's journey when you're not tracking your users? And we, we use other people's data. We use panel data that's fully opted in, fully consented, um, people who have agreed to have their data used in this way. This data, it comes from outside the ad ecosystem. Um, it's, it doesn't have anything to do with third-party cookies. And what it lets us do is it lets us see how this moment fits into people's digital journeys. Um, we're looking at over a million people. And so we can see where this moment fits in across all of these digital journeys. Importantly, it lets us see how this, how this site, how this moment, um, how this site's used in the wild. So how people actually visit this site, which turns out to be way more informative than understanding the content that the publisher decided to put on the page. Because what you see when you're looking at how this site is used in real life, you see what's visited before and after this site, and what's visited before and after those sites. And all of that contains all of these signals about why this site was visited, what's the intent behind that visit, and what is this person likely to do next? So we have all of these signals, all of this understanding about this moment. Um, we need a way to, to extract it all, capture it all, make it usable. So we built a map. Um, we built a map of the internet, and it's, it's not just any map of the internet. It's an AI-based map of the internet. Um, this map is in 128 dimensions. So every website gets a spot in this 128 dimensional space. Here we're showing it in, in, two, in 2D. It's hard to show 128D on this, on this screen. And so every dot here is a website. Um, this map, it's, it's built and it's continuously updated using a neural network that's using a self-supervised training process. So this AI is teaching itself what these websites mean by looking at all of these behavioral data points um, millions of, through millions of journeys um, and, and over years. And the behavioral patterns and the intent behind each website is captured by its position in that 128 dimensional space. So you get 128 numbers that go with every single website that contain all of this super rich information. And so this map, this, this map of the internet is our foundational data source that we're gonna use to build ID free custom AI. This is, this is so important and contains so much information. I'm gonna dive in deeper just to give you a feel of like what this thing actually is. It contains, it contains so much. So um, we're zoomed in now in like a tiny neighborhood of the map of the internet. So every dot here is a website. Um, and I've hand labeled some of the dots to, to help kind of give you an idea of what this means. So websites that are in nearly exactly the same spot on this map are websites that are about nearly the, exactly the same thing, visited kind of interchangeably. And, and what they mean, it's, it's kind of interchangeable in terms of what it means in someone's journey when you see this website. So here you see these high-end audio sites. Um, and they kind of mean the same thing in terms of what they mean when someone visits that in someone's journey. So the real power of this map isn't just that it can see which sites are almost exactly the same. It's that it can also see which sites are kind of related and related in a whole variety of different ways. So near the sites about gear for playing music, you hear um, playing audio, you see sites about recording audio, gear for making music, information about learning music, information about listening music. And so it's understanding each of those behaviors 
separately and then also how they're related to each other. And then you can kind of go in a different direction from the audio and think about gear for making visuals, camera blogs, um, photography sites, graphic design sites. So the point is, there is a, every single ad supported website is on this map someplace. We're just looking at a little corner right here. And this contains tons of subtle information about how exactly every site, how they're related, how they're the same, how they're different in a way that's quantitative. So I can tell you exactly, you know, in math, how tightly related um, each of these different websites are. So this is then what is gonna underlie our ability to build brand specific ID free custom AI models that can make these targeting decisions based just on the information in the moment um, that are really powerful, valuable targeting decisions. Now this is all behavioral, right? All of this was learned not by reading anything on the page, just by looking at the patterns and how sites were visited. So this is our foundational data source for our behavioral inventory solution that lets you do behavioral targeting without identity. So first assumption down, I'm gonna move on to the next assumption. All right, first party data will get me through this. And what I've found is that um, a brand's devotion to the power of their first party data is, is so deep that the this in this sentence can almost be anything, right? First party data will get me through um, signal deprecation or changing norms about, uh, about privacy or loss of identifiers or a bad breakup. It just that first party data, it's just, it's there for you. You know, you've got it, it's so valuable. And, it, and it's true, first party data, there's, there's nothing like it. Like it has, you own it, it has information about your customers, um, it's, it lets you reach them. Um, the, the real, the limitation though comes in activation. And that's because when you think about the inventory that's available, you have this spectrum of how, um, how much identity is available on each piece of inventory and how addressable that inventory is. And when you think about what this spectrum looks like after cookies are gone, the one-to-one the -one addressable uh, uh, inventory is just like the little bit at the top of that pyramid there. You really have limited opportunities to directly activate that first party data. So it's not enough just to have first party data. You need a way to make the most of your first party data. And this is where AI really comes into play because AI can really help you just milk a relatively small data set for, for all it's worth. And so with ID Free, we take that first party data, that little bit from the top of the pyramid, we combine it with the map of the internet, which remember has all of that understanding about all of the targetable moments. The AI algorithm is then able to take that first party data and with the help of the map of the internet, translate it into targeting decisions that can be applied and activated on any piece of web inventory, um, whether or not there's, there's, there's any kind of identifier. So let's look at what this looks like. How do we do this in, in, uh, in practice? So we overlay that brand's first party data on the map of the internet. And that acts as like a seed signal for, for intent, for interest in that brand. Um, this can be, because the map of the internet has so much information in it already, um, one of the powers of this type of AI is that it lets us do this with really a relatively small first party data set and just extract all of the information it can. Or if first party data is not available, um, there's a lot of way, a great proxies that you can use instead of first party data. In any case, once that, that mapping is done, it's overlaid on the, the map of the internet, the AI algorithm then expands that first party data so that um, you have a you have an understanding across every targetable site on the internet. And what you get is a customized predictive intent score for every possible impression that you could show. And it answers this question. In this moment, in this moment of this ad impression, how likely is this person, uh, how interested is this person likely to be in your, in your message? Um, and so this, this solution it's, it's taken that small first party data set, expanded it to internet scale across the whole internet. Um, and you won't see this anywhere else because this is a patented solution. And the real power behind it is the fact that it's able to use those behavioral signals to come up with a specific score on every single piece of inventory across the internet so that you can then do that effective targeting at scale, whether or not there's any identifiers. Um, so, and this, is a great way to make sure that you make the most of that first party data set. Okay, so moving on to my, my last assumption, uh, cookie solutions are for after third party cookies are gone, which still when I look at it, it seems like a pretty innocent statement. 
Um, at Distillery, we started developing ID-free custom AI in 2019, actually before Chrome announced that they were planning on getting rid of cookies. And our, our internal decks about this project had, had that image of that box that's like in case of emergency break glass. And we were developing a solution for just in case cookies were gonna someday go away. And implicit in that was this assumption that it was only gonna be useful if cookies actually went away. So since then, we've learned that um, there's actually, the, the interesting thing that happened is when Chrome made that announcement that they were gonna retire cookies, it kicked off this whole wave of innovation um, across the industry. And so there's tons of, tons of innovative solutions out there that it turns out are actually useful today, whether or not cookies ever go away. So I'm gonna give you two examples about that today, both about custom AI, of course, ID-free custom AI. Um, the first one is about healthcare. So this is a really interesting application of the ID free technology. Um, and this is something we learned about actually when healthcare agencies started coming to us and telling us that this would be a good application of this technology. So um, in healthcare, um, they wanna target, uh, they wanna target patients, of course, target patients precisely and use the best available data. But there's a lot of regulations around this, right? There's HIPAA, there's NIA, there's the policies within the DSPs, um, all these things that are really with good reason preventing them from taking health data and using it for individual level targeting. So we're talking about things like sensitive conditions where it's just not appropriate to do that kind of individual level targeting with that kind of data. So the cool thing about custom patient targeting, which is um, the, the healthcare version of our ID-free technology, is that it avoids all of these privacy concerns entirely. So we're able to take the best data, take ICD-10 codes and search terms and, um, and build models that because they select impressions and not individuals, um, avoid any problems that you run into when you start doing user level and individual level targeting. And it works really well. So here we're showing an example where, um, where it lowered the CPA by a lot compared to a contextual solution, while at the same time driving way more impressions. So this is a really effective solution and it's totally valuable, irregardless of what happens to cookies and useful today. My second example is about high-performing reach. Uh, so again, we, when we first developed ID-free, we were thinking of it as a way to target inventory that doesn't have IDs. Um, but of course, you can also use it to target inventory that does have IDs. Um, and so one thing that we found is that ID-free works really well as a complement to ID-based targeting solutions, and you can use them both together. And, and I really am talking specifically about uh, when campaigns that are run on traffic with cookies. You know, a lot of times marketers are focused on those KPIs that are measured only with cookies. And today, while cookies are around, they're gonna target only cookies so they can measure all their cookie-based KPIs. For those campaigns, what we've seen is if you're already running ID, our distillery's ID-based version of custom AI, and you add on the ID-free version, you increase, increase reach by up to 80% without taking any performance hits. And that's because ID-free is actually finding different people. It's finding people who maybe haven't left all of those digital breadcrumbs that, um, that would make an ID-based solution possible for them to find. And so it's finding different people. It also performs well, and so you expand your reach without losing performance. So this is another great use of, um, a, a great example of a cookie-free technology that's useful even today before cookies go away. Um, and so something to look out for as you're, as you're looking at new solutions and testing new solutions, not just how useful are these post cookie when it's the only alternative, but can, how much value can they provide to my campaigns that are running today and to, to problems that I face today. So the key takeaways, the next innovation in identity is no identity. Um, and this is really all about challenging assumptions about targeting and about identity. So first, behavioral targeting requires identity, while behavioral inventory solutions tie behavioral signals to inventory. And with rich enough behavioral signals, this can drive really strong performance at scale. So you can have behavioral targeting without any identity that works work super well and scales. First party data will get me through this. Yes, first party data is great, but if you have first party data, make sure you're looking for AI-based solutions that really help you get the most mileage out of that first party data. And cookie list solutions are for after third party cookies are gone. Uh, sure, they're definitely for after third party cookies are gone, but they're also for today a lot of times. And so as you're vetting these solutions, make sure you're looking out for situations where 
these, these solutions can solve the problems that you're having today. Thank you. So we have some time for questions. Um, and if you raise your hand, there's someone with a mic will come and you can ask a question. So you mentioned that the um, the the uh, map of the internet that you created requires panel data. Mm -hmm. um, would theoretically, if you used like different cohorted uh, panels, would you get a different map of the internet? Oh yes. Yeah. So we are um, we're doing some work in in Europe that that's relatively new for us. And what we found there is that we like to create a different map of the internet for each market. So we have a, a German map of the internet and we have a UK map of the internet, which is different from our North American map of the internet. Would that be true even within, uh, like for example, if you wanted to create a map of the internet for renters versus owners? Oh right? yeah. Like would, would functionally, would that change the output? I see. So the, the, we, the reason why we, within a region within North America, we put everyone in the same map of the internet is because it's not a map of the people. Like we're not, we're not mapping it. We're, we're really not trying to understand any individuals or target any individuals. We want to understand those behaviors. And so what you'll see is that the behaviors of renters and buyers will, it'll become apparent how they're different because the patterns they're visited, you know, they're visited by separate cohorts of people. That's all those kind of cohorted type behaviors is all part of the behavior that we want to pick up on all in one map of the internet. That's a map of inventory rather than being a map of people. Just to follow up item, what you just said, do you see any changes in behavior by age or you see it the same across when you have built this map? So, we, what we see, we see inventory, like pockets of inventory that maybe index higher or lower for different age groups. Like you can kind of overlay those things on a map. Um, we, again, we don't map that separately. We like, we don't, we, we map all the, the goal is to understand the inventory rather than trying to understand the people specifically. But you'll see that if there's a trend in a certain type of people that visits a set of inventory that's going to cluster together. And that's the same. I mean, it's true for things like age and it's also true for just things like interests and tastes and like what people are spending their free time on. All of that will sort of find itself, find the little pockets that are related on the map of the internet. Thank you. I have a question. How can you measure this if you're targeting people without IDs? Yeah, this is, this is a big question. This is an important question that I think the industry as a whole needs to catch up on, which is, I think we can recognize, you know, we looked at that pyramid. As we move past cookies, less and less of the inventory out there will have IDs on it. Fewer people will be attached to an ID and, and less of the time they'll have an ID associated with them. So there's going to be less and less targeting with IDs out there. Um, there's, there's kind of different ways to to follow your measurement on this. If you stick to measurement that only measures individuals and one-to-one um, -one behavior, then your universe shrinks. You know, you'll only target what you can measure and your universe shrinks and now you're, you're in a very small part of the world fighting for a small group of people, paying a premium there and missing out on a huge swath of the audience. So it really is going to be impossible to have a high ROI uh, after, after cookies are gone. Um, and the same thing kind of translates to other to other um, channels, like without IDFAs, without identifiers in different channels. If you're only focused on a diminishing number of one-to-one -one identifiers, it's going to be impossible to keep up. So we need to switch to aggregated type measurement, um, whether that means uh, modeled probabilistic measurement or something built into the browsers, like an API or the old school MMM. Um, all of those things are, and maybe all of those things together are going to be a better solution for ROI than, than chasing the individuals and, and everyone competing over those same individuals.